Hey, what's up? It's Christine Horn, The Booking Magnet. Welcome back to another episode of Booking Magnet Magic. Oh, today I'm interviewing my brother from another mother, Dave Pelleggi. Man, Dave and I have known each other quite some time from our Atlanta days. We've even done a television show together back in the day called Complications. But he has been acting since 2008. He's an improviser. He's a stand-up comedian. He has over 350 bookings in TV, film, commercials, and industrials. 350, okay? He's funny, he's relatable, he's an author, he's a dad, he's a, he's a husband, and more than that, he's a really good friend and a talented actor. I'm so excited for you to watch this interview because whenever I talk to Dave, we just, we're just always in sync, right? You know, it's just nice. It's like, it's that birds of a feather. It's like attracts like, right? So that's why, you know, I love getting to share Dave with the world. So enjoy this interview and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Dave Pelleggi. Woo! Wait, you know, if, I'm singing, if I'm singing your name, you're very special <laughs> to me. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. I'm so excited to be here with you. Like, I've been looking forward to this so much. Yay! Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying yes. I know you get lots of requests. I know we're all busy. The time of this interview, we were in pilot season. I know you, you're a coach, you're a dad, you're, you're a producer, all the things, Winnie Hat. So I, I really do truly thank you for pouring into our community because it's very easy for us to just get ours and be, be good. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's part of my calling. I've always felt like it's yes, the entertainment industry, but also pouring in and helping others reach their calling much like you. So yeah, yeah so it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm so excited to do it. Yes. Well, let's dive in. Let's dive in. You all in for a treat. Don't worry. Any link, any websites, any way you can connect with Dave will be in the show notes and anything related to this video. So don't worry. Okay. Just take that off your, off your shoulders. <laughs> you know, this whole booking magnet magic series is, first of all, I love being a fly on the wall and I love studying people and understanding what makes people tick and why some people are successful in something and some are not. And what, drives people and also what stops people like that just I'm just interested in that mm -hmm. and you know I've known you for quite some time we met in Atlanta um we knew each other in the middle of in circles but then we did a project together called complications yeah so fun I think we really bonded one day over a lunch yes. I don't know if you remember this but it was a lunch. it was during when we were shooting the pilot <laughs> and we were sitting around and we were all kind of talking about how we our audition process and how we got the audition. And I remember you had me in stitches. I mean, I was hurting from laughing because you were talking about, you had a, <laughs> you had a scene where you were, you had some physicality and you were telling us how you, you put the couch or the bench in your room and then you were fighting your own. And I was like, I love this guy. He's free and fun and did what it takes. And he's here. So it right. Do you remember that day? I do. I do. I have, we used to have, so my wife's like a big time decorator lady. So she always gets this cool stuff in the house. Well, we had this four foot long, two and a half foot wide ottoman. So in the scene, I was supposed to wrestle this patient who was getting violent, right? Yes, that's what it was. So I was like, all right, this ottoman's coming. So I picked this ottoman up and put it just out of frame. And you know, did my line like, hey, you need to lay back down and then grab that ottoman. And I mean, it was Rodeo Town, USA. I, <laughs> that poor ottoman was like, I'm just supposed to be on my legs, but I was getting it. And hey, I booked the thing. And it was so funny because uh, <laughs> on set, I had two separate people say, hey, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have an ottoman here for you to wrestle. <laughs> um, you know, we couldn't, it's not in the budget. Like they remembered like that moment of me <laughs> wrestling it. It's hilarious. I loved it. Oh, that is one of my favorite stories. I just don't, I think ever since then, like I said, I just locked you in a special place in my heart. So <laughs> I'm willing to go there and I respect that. <laughs> oh, I had to do it because I know myself well enough to know that if I'm just like mm, 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 faking it, it's going to be like, is that dude okay? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So I was like, I got to go for it. And if it's too much, I, oh, well, it's too, much. Me too much. I love it. Just give us a little background. And I don't think I've ever asked you really this question personally, but where are you from? Like, how did you even get into the arts? How did it start for you? Great question. Um, so I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and then lived in the Bronx when I was a little kid up till probably five, six, seven ish, something like that. And then moved to Western New York near Buffalo, Rochester area. Grew up, graduated high school out there. Um, I was always the dude making everyone laugh everywhere I went from a little tiny kid all the way up through high school. Um, my teachers were always like, look, I love you. But for God's sakes, do some work. Right? <laughs> like, they were like, I, can, I, I will get fired if right. I pass you with the amount of work you've done. Like, freaking give me something. So all the way through, it was just, but there was no arts program when I was growing up. Mm. Little tiny high school I went to, Perry, New York. Uh, loved the teachers. The teachers were legit invested. It's one of them small little towns that... I mean, just blessed teachers just pulling me aside going, you're freaking better than this. Let's go. Yeah. And I was like, uh, okay. But I really struggled in academics. Like I, I was a, 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 you know, the first letter of my name is D. So I wanted D's in everything. And so <laughs> that's what I got. Right. <laughs> like, um, it, it was so bad. In fact, my parents will be embarrassed, but also they still laugh at this. They would give, you know, my sister is a psychologist right now. My brother is a vet, right? So them two are like powerhouse intellectuals. They were all through school. They could sleep, wake up, get A's, never touch a book in anything. They just knew it. It was crazy. My parents would give them like 20 bucks per A that they got and per subject, right? I would get 20 bucks per C. Then I can't. They you were like, adjust. you got to adjust for the kids. They were like, look, if you please, just please, <laughs> pa just pass. <laughs> just, just please, for the love of God, just pass. So I had always been the guy making everybody laugh. I also played baseball. I was a, did every sport, like everything. I was just athletic. I was the fastest kid anywhere. Like I was even in little league. I was like five years old on a seven year old team. Like I was just fast. So I was, I, I just kind of leaned into the athletic thing because there was never arts anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I got a baseball scholarship to a small, small little school in Missouri, went out there to play. And again, team clown, right? Like full ride, no worries, paying people to do my schoolwork for me. So I could, I was like, not too smart. I'm not an AB guy. I'm a C-ish guy. So keep, so I'd pay people. They do my work, play baseball, make people laugh. That was the jam. Well, one day I get approached by uh, a girlfriend of one of my teammates who was like, Hey, we've got this huge, like school-wide rally. Cause we're playing our rivals. And we always do some sort of theatrical kind of presentation would you mind being a part of it because we're going off the rails this year and you're really funny mm -hmm. I was like yeah sure whatever like all right so they give me this part they wanted to do a modern day spoof of like a Jerry Springer type show and they asked me to be Moses and they were like we want to do like you know how or, or excuse me excuse me excuse me Abraham because okay. you know God told Abraham and his wife they were in their 90s and he was like you're gonna have a kid and they're like ha -ha. Good right. one. And then the wife was like, hey, see that hottie? Why don't you hook up with her? And Abraham was like, if you're okay with it, then hooked up with her, right? So I'm Abraham in between those two women, right? And so there's a big argument and they wrote this hilarious script. Well, I'm sitting there like, and these are like actors, like seniors. Everyone is a senior. I'm a freshman baseball player, not in any theatrical classes at all. So they're just like, you know, they're doing the whole, I am Sarah. I came from a small town. In the middle this is my of motivation. Right. And they're like, what about you? I'm like, uh, I grew up in church and my dad preached about this one time. So I'm good. Like, I'm just like, I have no clue. So I improvised my way through the scene and the entire place went crazy. They went crazy. Like my Abraham was kind of hood. So I was like, I was like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, my wife is saying, you know, the hook up and the hook up. So I was like, hi, then. And they were done. They were done. They were like, who is this dude? And what is happening? So, uh, so that was like my 
end of my freshman year, sophomore year, played baseball as well, but just lost interest. It was just, it got very businessy. Mm-hmm. Dudes taking steroids, getting big money from supply. And it just got to be so convoluted. I just wanted out. Yeah. So uh, a girl that I was uh, dating at the time moved to Florida. So I moved down there and a friend of mine lived there. I helped him run his business. And I just figured like, well, I'm out of school. I'm out of baseball. Let's just make a bunch of money. Yeah. Got in the business consulting realm, helping my friend run his business. And then literally just was spinning in this corporate world, helping. I went to church too. I was always a church kid. So I found a church, went in there, helped with youth stuff, and then just bounced around in business stuff forever. Helping a friend run a company down in Gulf Shores through my travels of moving. um, I meet my wife, Wendy. She's in college at University of Alabama getting a drama degree. So I'm like constantly driving to Tuscaloosa, watching her plays, meeting all of her thespian friends, right? And I'm like, I'm legit at home. Like I'm a business, I'm a business consultant. Like I've got clients, I'm doing the business call thing and I'm with them and I'm like, this is freaking awesome. But I was raised very much in this, in this environment even though it was very cool and and everything was great church wise, but it was very much like freaking make the money. Yeah. Yes. Dreams are fine. Blah, blah, blah. Great. But yo, you got to get something solid and then do that on the side. So my parents never discouraged me from going after the dream. They were just always that it great. Cool. You can have fun with that. Fun. Right. But make the money with plan A. Mm hmm. So Wendy truly was the first person that I ever met in my whole life that was like, I'm freaking being an actor. And I was like, great, do it. But very much in the back of my head, like, "Uh, you should probably, you know, that thing. Mm -hmm. 2008 market crashes. Firm that I'm working for. I did. I was like, part-time, part-time. I was like doing some ministry stuff and then doing some like helping youth stuff and then doing business stuff. Market crashed. All of it went away. Like everyone, firm closed down. Love y'all. Bye. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nonprofit was like, so thank you so much for your help, but we're closing. So there we sit. She was a manager of a boutique, high-end boutique here up here in the Atlanta area. Shut down. So we're looking at each other going right now. (laughs) uh, Okay. Um, And I was like, you know, we now have quote unquote, nothing. As we've worked all these years for other people, why don't we just focus in and do what we do for us? Mm -hmm. The worst that could happen. The absolute worst is being right where we are Right. right now. True. Where we thought, where you thought you had something that was, you could rely rely on. Yes. That was dependable. 100%. (laughs) So she does a search and finds this improv troupe audition here in Atlanta. And she's like, get in the car. (laughs) And I was like, okay. She drives me down to the studio. She's like, improv auditions are in there. Go. I was like, what? I was taking, I was like, I don't know if we we're doing this today. Like, what? She's like, I knew you'd overthink it or do some things or the whatever, because your business mind would just go. Right. So I go in there and I still remember Brian Chapman, uh, legit taught me everything I know, uh, improv wise and, and it just phenomenal on so many levels. Audition with the troop, do some stuff. He calls me that night and he's like, man, you know, we had a lot of people audition Tons of people want into this thing. Uh, we had to cut almost everyone except you and one other person. So you're in. Took improv for about a month and a half-ish. Had my first show. There were two agents in the crowd afterwards. Came up to me, shook my hand. Uh, and it was a bomb show. It's one of those shows where you feel like this divine something happening. Mm-hmm. Like it's this thing that was clicking and, and even afterwards, like Brian shook my hand and he's like, I've never seen anything like that. And he, he's, he was in it for 15 years at that point. Right. And this is my first show ever. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm letting it rip. Like, hope this doesn't suck. 
right? <laughs> like, and even people in the troop were like, bro, this was super special. Come up after the show, shake people's hands, you know, shake hands, kiss babies, hug people, do the thing. And two agents are like, hi, we're so-and-so. Here's our card. We'd like to see you Monday morning. If you don't mind, we'd love to sign you. And I was like, okay. They were like, bring a headshot and resume with you. I was like, touch, great. I don't even know what that means, right? Like, I literally don't know anything about the industry at all, except hanging with thespians uh, and b- being an improv for a month, right? Like, I have no idea. Right. So I show up Monday to the agent. I have my business headshot. <laughs> of course. Business, Dave. <laughs> and I hand them my work resume. And they're like, what oh. is that? What, what is this? I'm like, what? You said bring my resume. They're like, no, your acting resume. I'm like, I don't know what acting resume. It's my first improv show ever. They were like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, brother. I don't have a clue. They were like, this, you've got to be kidding me. Okay. So they literally bring me to Facebook to see some Facebook group stuff that's out there to get auditions for indie stuff. A bunch of random websites at the time that were posting like local audition for indie stuff. And they were like, shoot something every single week, as many things as you possibly can. We got to get stuff on your resume. You got to learn this industry as fast as you can because you're talented. Your talent will bring you so far, but your understanding will bring you the rest of the way. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So I booked 15 indie projects in three months. Wow. Wow. And just was shooting, just, just, I was on sets that I pray to Jesus nobody ever knows about. Like, it was like, it was some of the worst stuff in the world. I, but it was experience. But it was experience. And look, I was on, there, there are people who have told stories like this, but I literally have tangibly lived the, this, where the guy was like, yo, yo, yo. Um, our audio guy didn't show up. So we're going to use a 50 come in super, super tight on you. So if you could hold the mic right here while you talk, keep it still. And then you do that. And then I'm going to have the light connected to my back and I'm going to spin. So the light will move, but you keep them. (laughs) I'm literally in this super deep, intense moment. Like you touched my family. Now I'm going to kill you. I'm, I recorded the audio of that line. Of the crescendo of the whole film, I'm the oh, audio tech. If right? you can do that, you can do anything. I was like, come on, let's go. So I'm with that agent over that three months. I, I'm booking all this indie stuff. They get me an audition at Stillwell Casting. And one of the casting directors at the time is big famous Melissa from Walking Dead, right? When she was back there casting. Oh, sorry, so my, yeah, my first ever audition, I walk in there. Again, nobody told me nothing. I don't know what I'm doing. I walk in there like, and she's like, all right, just stand up there, slate, and we'll go ahead and do it. What does that word? I'm literally like this, like, uh, I'm trying to remember if anyone has ever said that to me. If anyone has ever told me anything about the word slate, I'm thinking, slate, 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 what the hell is a slate? And she stops recording and she's like, is there a problem? I was like, um, so sorry. This is my first time doing this. <laughs> what is a slate? And she got red. Cause you know, Melissa like that stuff tight. Yeah. She don't play. She leans into me and goes, say your name. I was like, I could just leave. If you want me to like, <laughs> Like, there really ain't no for it. Like, girl, I, I'm good at reading people. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, let, just, we could just mix this whole thing if you want. So, you know, I do the thing. And then I, I'm like, okay, Dave Belegic. And she's like, and who is your agent? I'm like, oh, this is bad. So, <laughs> I, so I leave there fully like, well, indie projects it is for the rest of my happy little time on this jam. Well, I freaking get a call three days later that I freaking booked it it was a Home Depot commercial and I was like I'm sorry what (laughs) that girl about burnt me to the ground in the room but you never forgot you never forgot I have slated perfectly ever since (laughs) right but that was the start of it and I realized that a couple of things that as long as I am really connected to what I know I'm supposed to be doing 
and that I don't take myself too seriously, right? Like I could have left that room going, I'm done. I'm done. Like that's embarrassing. A lot of people, a lot of people would have. Right. I just left there and was just like, well, there's one for the learning books. <laughs> like, <laughs> but like in the audition, it was just like, talk about the deck you built and improv your way through whatever. And I can make up whatever. Right. So that's literally the thing that kind of booked me because that's all they wanted in the whole commercial. What do you think is a part of your makeup, your divine makeup that makes you so free in that way? You clearly had it as a child, even playing baseball and, Mm -hmm. and like in your early days of just like, this is just, I'm just going to like, what happens in your brain? That's, because there's a lot, and I know there's a lot of people going to watch this or listen to this and be like, I wish I could be that free. I wish I could. How, how do you not worry about what people are going to think? And how you how do you just allow yourself? Yeah. Are you in tune to what that might be? I Outside am. of a God-given gift? I, I am. I, I really believe, even as a kid, I still remember this moment when my mom looked at me one time because I was really afraid to go to baseball practice the first I think I was like seven or eight and I was on a 10 year old team and them kids were big I was a small dude my whole life I'm still a towering five nine five nine and a half when I slate you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so um I was really afraid and she, she said do you know the reason why you're on this team and I was like I just kind of sat there you know not really even thinking I should answer because I had no clue she said you are the answer to a problem they have. And I just kind of looked at her and she said, you will always be an answer to someone's problem. Mm -hmm. And I felt this thing in me go, oh, okay. So I've just kind of gone through life going, well, somebody got a problem I can fix somewhere. (laughs) Right? Like, there's some sort of something that I'm made for to do in some way, shape or form. Right. And it's interesting because I've always just had this thing. And my mom was always big too. I never take yourself too seriously. Okay. Take your, take your task seriously, but not yourself seriously. Right. So I always was just in this space of having this attitude of like, I mean, if I don't get it, it's fine. Like there's something going to be another one, right? Like, and I've just had that kind of free flowing thing. Um, you know, even when I had, you know, in the whole dating game of our life, you know, we all try to impress and overly impress. A lot of girls were really mad that I was so nonchalant. I'm like, yeah, it works out fantastic. If it does, yeah, that's fine. And they're like, wait, what? You don't care. Like, what the air? And I'm like, I, no, I mean, you're great. Like, it's great. It's great. But if, I mean, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, right? Like, but, you know, I, I hate to even. I can, imagine, I can imagine that not sitting well with some people. With any of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and it's so interesting because, like, there was one, one girl in particular stands out to me because she was really not happy with the whole, like, I can make stuff up whenever type thing. Um. It's like, well, how do I know you're always telling? Right. You're how do I know you're telling the truth? <laughs> you lying? No, I'm not lying. Like, no. Like, are you improvising right now with me? Oh, no. I hate, I hate that question. I used to get that too back in the day. Like, what the crap? Like, uh, you know, like in college, we went to this bar and it just happened to be ke- what they call Kevin Bacon competition. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. So know. it's been around forever. We're talking about a long time ago and they still have these where you go, you sign up on this list and they call you up and it's a competition. You and another person on stage and they say someone's name like Glenn Close. And you're supposed to be able to define how that person is connected to Kevin Bacon, right? Oh, wow. Okay. In some ways. And there are Kevin Bacon aficionados who know everything about this dude's life, right? So I, we go into this place and I'm like, I can freaking do that. That's freaking easy. So I go in there, sign up. They have me up on the stage, on the stage, on the stage. It's a thousand dollar prize for this, for this thing. It was a bar in St. Louis. So I'm up there. I beat the first person, second person, third person. Right. And I'm just rolling through. I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, what are these people? 
like how did they like it's so like they're struggling they're like um um i'm like i already can do that like what are you waiting on then they'll come to me and i'll say a bunch of stuff and they're like oh my god right like it was the weirdest craziest thing now this is back in the day i hate to say even before the internet right. but like it was like you know back in the day Pretty, so i get to the champion google anything right you can google anything so get to the championship i they say some random name i've never heard of well i talk about how their person is connected to Kevin Bacon, making all these things. And these people are like, this dude is, you've got to be kidding me. So I win championship. Yay. Thousand bucks. Fantastic. We get in the car and she goes, I cannot believe you know all that about Kevin Bacon. Where, where have you studied? Where have you learned all this stuff about Kevin Bacon? I'm like, what? She's like, the level of detail that you know about him is weird i'm like what are you talking about i don't know anything about kevin bacon she's like what i'm like what she's like you cheated in that thing i'm like i didn't cheat what are you talking about like everybody just made it up right and then i'm looking at her and then i realized these people actually studied his life (laughs) and knew actual things I'm riffing. I'm making stuff up about his aunt who used to live in Britain, who then moved to the United States and met this dude and they had a baby and then they were cousins. And then the dude became a producer and got him a role on the film. People are like, ah, and really? Like, no fact checking. None at all. <laughs> there was not one. And I'm like, how do you guys give me some college dude a thousand bucks to win this thing? So she broke up with me because she's like, I can't trust you at all. I can't trust the thing that you say. Not I one thing out your mouth hilarious when so, did but you... like <laughs> all my life i've just been like okay let's just do it like that's just been the attitude no matter what i've done and so yeah it's just always been free flowing like nothing is going to be life or death until it's time to die right <laughs> like so might as well just riff and have fun with it i love that you know you know i, <laughs> I love everything about this story <laughs> How did you know? I didn't. Wow. <laughs> I was like, huh? What are you talking about? Hey, what's up? It's Christine Horn, the booking magnet. I am so excited to invite you to our next event. It is called Booking Magnet Live. It's happening in Atlanta, Georgia on July 15th and 16th, 2022. You're going to spend two days surrounded with actors oh, just like you actors who want more, actors who are looking for a safe space, a sanctuary, a safe haven to express themselves, to learn, to grow, and to connect. So I'm excited for you to experience that. Make sure you join us July 15th and 16th. You can click the link below, and I'm so excited to see you there. I'm gonna shift a little bit into you when you watch performers specifically mm-hmm. and this could be when you were a kid up to now i know for me there are certain things about certain people that draw me in like i can't even sometimes i can't even put my, my a finger a finger on it or a spe- specific word to it but mm-hmm. there's something about certain performers they light up the screen it's the way the cadence which they speak the way they create characters something that just, I'm literally like a magnet. I just want more, more. Mm-hmm. What are some of those things for you when you're, when you're taking in a performance from someone? What is it? What is the thing, you know, you know, coming up in the theater, my mentor, Freddie Hendricks used to say, like, if we can see, if you can see, if they can see, if you can see them, they can see you. Right. So I don't care if you are in the back of the theater, mm-hmm. in the back row, right, right by the wings, like still serve because somebody may be laser focused on you. And I never forgot that. And I would be serving no matter where I was on that stage because there could be something magnetic about that person in the way, way back. So what is that for you when you're taking in a performance? What are some of those qualities that you, that stand out to you? Phenomenal question. I, I, even growing up, I always loved people who, when I watched them, I could, I could relate, not just to the story, but the moments. So interesting, even as a kid, I would be just watching a movie, right? Like growing up, we watched Rocky, right? When the originals, when they were coming out back in the day. 
And I would be, my dad, my mom both remember these moments where I was like, oh, did you see that moment? And they were like, what? Like when he looked at her and they were having this moment, like you could, he was like, oh my God. Like I would see those things. And they were like, they're just talking. And then they would rewind it and go, oh, wow, there is a moment there. Mm -hmm. I would just be moved by moments where people would be connecting. And I knew that there was something about the people connection that moved me. That was always something that I, I, I've just always noticed. And it's interesting because in those moments, as I've grown up, hearing people talk about those moments in the film, right? Like you watch the film and then you see the interviews of them about the film, right? Almost 100% of the time, almost. You'll hear that actor go, I, I was so scared that it wasn't connecting. Like I was so, I felt like I wasn't enough. Like I kept asking the director, are you sure we got, are you sure we got it? Are you sure? I just feel like I could. And it was interesting to me because all growing up and we all have this little voice in us questioning if we're enough. Mm -hmm striving to connect, striving to be enough. And I noticed a lot of those scenes that moved me, later I find out that the real human being actor was so struggling in that moment to be enough to connect that my subconscious was reading that going, I've been there. So I realized that I am really moved by people who struggle like me. And I bring... I've always been in love with stories. Even now being in the industry, I can lose myself and not be hyper-technical, hyper-critical. I just lose myself in it. And it's interesting how the people that move me the most, without me even knowing, later I find out that their story is similar to mine in some way, shape, or form. Interesting. So almost it's like you're drawn to the what maybe is a deep... Uh, a deep level of vulnerability and vulnerability being raw, being open. Yeah. And do you feel like you've borrowed, do you think that you've had a chance to borrow some of that in your own work? Oh yeah. Not just borrow. I have stolen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. Just yeah. to, FYI, the statue of limitation is still <laughs> right. Like, Stolen, flat yeah, out. I love Meryl Streep, you know, in an interview once for one of her couple movies, she, know, she's been in a few movies, right? Yeah. But one of her interviews, she was like, I love to steal from men. It's just harder to tell when I do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, and what I love when I'm always teaching and preaching to people I get to mentor is you're always going to be you and you can never, even when we borrow steal, however you want to say it from people, once we try it on, it is now ours. It's part of our makeup, right? It can never be duplicated, right? So, and I, I find that when I ask this question, when I when I interview actors, the thing that we are most drawn to is the thing we end up end up stepping into in our own craft, right? Mm -hmm. If you're drawn by someone who they just seem like they're just a leader, or they're just magnetic, or their voice shines, they just take up space, like whatever that is. Then we're like, I want to do that. I want to feel what that feels like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when I watch Beyonce, Beyonce knows how to take up space, take up a room and command the stage. And like, I'm like, oh, I love that. So I'm going to step into that. I'm going to borrow some of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, don't, I may not need it for every role or every performance. Right. But when I do, I, I have evidence of something that looks like something I might want to try one day. Yeah. And it's interesting that the vulnerability that draws me in is uh, because there are people who have had vulnerable moments on screen and I'm kind of like, eh. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. without really reason, without rhyme or reason, it's just not, something isn't really there. And it's interesting because I think the thing that draws me the most is when the people are vulnerable, but they push through the vulnerability, they push through the thoughts of weakness, they push through that barrier that they thought was keeping them there and they just do it. Mm -hmm. There's an actor, I won't name his name, but he was, you know, uh, people were talking about this great moment that he had on screen and oh my gosh, it was so great. And so whatever, and, da, 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 and what were you thinking about when you were connecting with her in this moment and this dude, and, and I had seen it so many times 
trying to feel the way other people told me they felt. They loved this moment. I would watch it and go, no, that's great. I mean, it's fine. It's great. That's good. I'm glad you like it, right? Like I couldn't get there. Watching this dude's interview, he was like, well, I mean, it was hard to kind of get there, but I just started thinking of my puppy and then I was, I was ready to roll. And then it was easy. It was great. And we just blew it. And it was almost flippant, right? Like it was just a thing, but everyone loved the moment so much because the story was phenomenal. And so they kind of allowed the story to carry them through that moment. It's just that moment didn't really hit me like it hit other people. And it's just so interesting how that has happened numerous times Mm -hmm. when people phone it in or the interview is just like, that it didn't really move me in the moment. I think it's that true vulnerability and then pushing through knowing I did everything I could to communicate this thing. It's that sincerity of working through that issue, I think that really just hits me and resonates with me because there's been a lot of ceilings in my life that I've had to bust through. Yeah. So I kind of feel that connection with that type of person, you know? I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think back on your the body of work that you've done, you've done so many things, which gig, which, which paid gig, I'll be more specific. <laughs> really confirmed that you were really good at what you do? Oh man, what a great question. I think it was the, yeah, it's gotta be. Okay, so uh, early on in my career, I was up against big dogs. For this now, now this is going to seem weird that I use this example, but this really, when I think back, this mm-hmm. was the thing. Yeah. I'd been in the right, right. industry probably six, seven months. My agent calls and goes, "We got a big, big deal. We ca- we help with casting with this every year. The people that book this thing, they make fifteen to twenty five grand, and it's only big dogs." They kind of like improv, so you might be able to do a little bit with whatever, but they're going to bring you in the room with the lead actor who always is like the mainstay face of the brand. So this was a corporate training video series okay, okay, for this big, huge company. And they're like, this dude loves to make actors crumble in their audition. He literally will email us and go, you better send some people with more clout than this. Cause I'm crushing them all. Like he's that level of like arrogance and whatever. Wow. Okay. She's like, I just tell people, cause I don't want new people like you to go in and get disappointed. And I'm laughing going, I got it. Just get me in the room. And she was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I'm like, J- just get me in the room. And they're like, Oh, there's no poor, poor Dave doesn't <laughs> understand. Right. There was this level of, and it's kind of been in me my whole life of whatever someone says the status quo is, I'm going to be the, I call it the grenade factor. I'm just going to blow it up and then just leave my mark. Good or bad, it's blown up. Right? Right. <laughs> so um, I, I go in the room and the first thing he says was, because I, I kind of look like a younger version of this guy. Okay. He's like, oh, look, a younger wannabe me. And I was like, so without thinking, without any sort of twitch, I don't know where it came from. Must it be from divine, like pouring out of heaven to me? <laughs> I, go, I go, oh, look, the older disappointed me that has to be doing corporate stuff at his age. <laughs> the whole room went, ah! And I'm cracking up laughing, going, I don't even know where that came from. That was freaking hilarious. <laughs> and they're like, who is this freaking kid? Right? So we do the audition, and he's trying to riff with me, like just trying to get me, try, just going off the rails. One line in particular solidified to me that I'm freaking here, right? So the director whispers in his ear, <laughs> Because the director and I was like, let's see if we can get this kid to break or whatever. Mm-hmm. So he's like, all right, we're going to do it. The guy, the cocky actor, reader guy goes, all right, we're going to do a new scene. Uh, you're um, being interviewed by me, a famous newscaster. 
internationally famous, world renowned. And so uh, here we go. And he does his thing. Welcome to Blah 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 News. We're here with uh, Gregory, who saw the whole thing. So, uh, Gregory, uh, even though you're blind in one eye and have terrible vision in the other, what did you see? And I literally, I, I go, so you're, so the camera is where he is, right? So I do this. I go, I'm looking off away right. from him, right? Like I'm blind, like he said, yes, anding, right? Yeah. So I look away from him and I'm like, oh my gosh, Mark, look, I, I know someone like you who is, who's almost famous is, is so like on the cusp of greatness that you're just, and he's like, please just answer the question. Uh, well, no, I just want to say I'm a big fan. Like, I know you're kind of obscure and not a lot of people know you, but I have posters of you on my wall. I think it's of you. I can't really see them, but I think <laughs> the figure is very simple. And he's trying to get me to answer the question because he's trying to set me up, I guess, for something. Yeah. And I just keep going on. And finally, he's like, damn it, Gregory, what did you see? I said, well, obviously, uh, I'm blind. So I saw a fuzzy figure scream out, help me. And then a pink blur go by and then a crash. And I just sat there silent and he was like holding his head <laughs> like and cut. All right. Thanks so much. And he was like, afterwards, so, so they're talking and whatever, we're supposed to go in the waiting room and see if they want to pull us back in. So they pull me back in. Director shakes my hand and said, look, we've been doing this for 13 years. You're the only actor that has never broken. Wow. He's, he told me on the spot, he's like, you booked this man. It's unbelievable what you did in this room. He's broken every actor that has ever come in here, man or woman, for 13 years. Wow. We, I can't even believe what you did in here. So we shot the stuff and we were riffing and improvising and whatever. I was making the crew break the director crack up. But it was in that moment when the director shook my hand, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm called to this junk. We ain't doing anything else the rest of my life. Yeah. Like, we go, we going, baby. We go. Oh, I love that so much. You know, there's always <laughs> there's always just a moment. I, I specifically asked you about a paid moment, and I'm sure there might have been I'm sure everyone I speak to, there's moments earlier where there's a whisper and there's a confirmation in the yeah. earlier. For me, it was in fifth grade. I did a play called Cinderella and the Prince of Pollution. I had one line. I was one of the sisters. And the line is, I'm all a flutter. It must be me. But I had to sing it. I was like, I'm all a flutter. It must be me. And I would sing it and practice it in the shower. And it was that line. I remember one of my students, like fellow classmates was like, that sounds good. I would keep practicing. And I was, I was like, I can sing. <laughs> I never forget. And that's what my mother at first, my mother, my mother never knew I could sing. She just heard me singing around the house. This one line, I'm all of the letter, must be me. I would practice the, the <laughs> modulations, the octaves. And so this, these tiny whispers. And then when we were younger, if we're, you know, if, if that's our path, because some people start later. But I think even people who start later, I have 70 year old clients who had a whisper when they were 10. Yeah. They life took them in another direction. So I, I love that story. And I'm sure those of you listening and watching can relate to your own. I want you to encourage you to think about when you got the whisper that maybe mm -hmm. you've ignored because of whatever reason, but know that it's not too late. It's not ever too late. You're right on time. So you Never. can start now in whatever arena it is that you want to do. Um, and, and as we get ready to wrap up, I do want to ask because I ask everybody this, especially our, our act, fellow actors. Look, this industry is like this, a good old roller coaster. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it just is. It is. You know, so even with a personality like yours and a work ethic like yours, where you're down for whatever, you go with the flow, but it doesn't mean you don't hit roadblocks from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean your faith doesn't get tested sometimes. I mean, you have an amazing book called 52 Pillars, which we'll put the link below, which I think is such a gift to people, not just artists. Um, but can you talk a bit about when you are faced with adversity, you know, and I'm not just talking about the role that you auditioned for that you really liked that you didn't get. I'm talking about like sometimes, you know, sitting in your own worthiness and, and mm -hmm. you're, and you're a parent, you're, you're a husband, like the, the, the pressures that come with, you know, making a living, like when you want to, the moments when you wanted to throw in the towel, look, I've had many days. I'm like, I could just be a holder culturist. I could just play with plants. <laughs> 
Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I have those days now. And I was I spent a day in the garden. Like I this I like planting basil. This is right. This fine. <laughs> I, I, there's an organic market every Saturday down the street. I'll sell me some. <laughs> so how do you get out, out of those moments? What, what are some of the tools? And I think that's really crucial for people who are taking this podcast. And what are the tools you use to, to get you back centered and to rem- remember? So, yeah, I'm just going to say it's out there. Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal question. Uh, I, I go through those times a lot. Yeah. Um, because there's always questions. I think one of the things that I realized is that I have to be built in a way that allows myself grace to question. Mm. I think a lot of people draw hard lines in the sand that if there's doubt, well, it must mean I must not be able to do it. If I'm if I'm even doubting me, right? And they do the whole throw, they don't allow themselves the grace to be that human and struggle through the decision, that is the weight lifting emotionally and spiritually. So I decided that no matter what I'm feeling, I'm going to let myself feel it. That's number one. That's the one of the ways to get through it. Many actors fight that. No, no, I'm an act. I'm an actor. And they fight and fight and fight, which is noble, yeah. but you're denying the part of you that needs to be acknowledged because if you deny the part that needs to be acknowledged, you're denying the workout. You have to be able to say to yourself right in the mirror and to Jesus and everybody else, whoo, am I doing the right thing? I need to think about this for a second. Yeah. Whoo. Because if you don't allow yourself to ask that, it's like going to the gym and only working out your right arm. Mm -hmm. it is voicing the doubt that eliminates the doubt putting a shining a light on it yes a hundred percent so that's the first decision i've allowed myself to feel all of it and even though there are some people who are like i've never gary vaynerchuk's big dude online right he's a big motivation someone's like do you ever have a bad day never i've got one in a trillion chance to be a human you kidding me i'm like boy you better get that junk out of here. You're either lion or superhuman yeah. or a robot, right? <laughs> like, which is fine. I'm glad for him. Yeah. But the way that I have to get myself up out is to remember a couple things. Number one is I really believe in my whole heart that I'm called to change the world through this. I really feel that in my bones, like even working corporate-ish stuff wherever, There was always the person I would see in the corporate environment that needed encouragement, a laugh, some sort of something. Um, No matter what was happening, I would always find that person. It's just embedded in me. Telling stories is always a part of it. Even when I was selling, even when I was VP of sales, even when I was this or that or whatever consultant, telling stories 100% of the time. It's just who I am. Mm -hmm. So when I'm down, you know, like for example, the wifey, you know, years ago when we were, you know, up and down on the roller coaster, she looked at me, tears in her eyes and her face going, how are we going to freaking make a match? And me going, I'll figure it out. Those moments I have to go back to God, you are the one that called me to this. You said the call is without repentance. So even if I do something else, I'm never going to get away from it. Which means you said you'll supply all my needs, which means you better ante up, show up. And number three, you said everything I put my hand to is blessed. So give me something to put my hand to. Mm. And so I knew that I could always write. So I started in those downtimes, just started journaling and writing. And then that translated into, let me figure out on, this is literally how I learned, on YouTube, how to write a script format what do i got to use how do i do it didn't have a clue so i started writing a lot of real life scenarios in script form that outlet brought me to people who would go wait a minute you write oh my god we're just we need to hire a writer for our corporate thing for the videos that we're going to do because the writer we used to have quit 
And I was like, how much does it pay? <laughs> like first question, like, what are we talking? Yeah. Five grand a month. I'm in, give me a contract. I'm signing it right now. <laughs> right. Like I realized that the scripture that I based my entire career on is my gift will make a way for me and usher me into the presence of the great. It's in Proverbs. I really believe if you have a solid foundation that you build something on, and that is what you focus on the most, it's literally going to manifest right in front of you. So I always remember, number one, I'm called to it, and my gift will make a way for me and usher me into the presence of the great. The other thing is, I realized what my mom said when I was little is 100% true. Yes, I'm going through a hard time right now, but I am the answer to someone's problem. Mm -hmm. I am the puzzle piece. They're literally on their knees right now in a secret room somewhere praying, God, please send me an ethnically ambiguous dude who's a decent enough actor to get this thing done so the client will love it. Ta-da! Right? <laughs> like, that's this guy. Yeah. So I literally realize I'm the answer to someone's problem everywhere. And then every level of my career, it's the same thing. Right now, I'm shopping scripts. I'm pitching uh, stuff that I've written. We had an offer on one. Uh, the legal didn't pan out, but that's another defining moment for me. It's been eight years I've been pitching, seven, uh, seven and a half, almost eight years I've been pitching projects. We had a couple of options and then uh, came off of options. So now I have a back. And then we had some people kind of interested, but not really. Now we got a freaking offer. I was like, wait a minute. What I'm writing is viable and legit. And we're about to change the world on this because that's real money. Mm -hmm. Just because the legal fell through, it, it, it bumped me up to another level of belief of going, now my, I've helped hundreds of people tell their stories and now it's time for me to tell mine. Yeah. yeah. So one of the ways I get through those low times is I'll start writing and I'll go through my affirmations. Like I have literally on the video, you could, you might be able to see uh, like just scrolling forever, affirmations, affirmations, affirmations. And I write my affirmations based on the doubts and negative thoughts that come into my, into my mind. Right, that way you can find the flip. You can find the flip to them. Find that flip and now you've got something to punch that thing in the throat. Yeah. And it helps immensely. Oh, that's so good. And thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, that's my favorite question to ask people because I don't think enough people in our industry talk about that talk about those quiet moments the lows the i mean it's easy to go on instagram and see the fabulous life right yes which is a part of it mm -hmm. but <laughs> there's so many more nights and days where you are needing to sit with yourself and go within um because also that's where the transformation happens and that's the work that transformation you do for yourself gets to be sh shown through your characters that you step into and yeah. telling your truths and everything. So I'm so grateful that you share that. I think the more, and that's what part of my assignment, I believe is to speak to the heart, the soul of the actor mm -hmm. and shine a light on the things that so many of us have had shame and fear around even talking about. And yeah. I think the more we can just say, Hey, yeah, I have days. I feel like I need to take a break. And I yeah. take a break and I go do something else. <laughs> yeah. And you know? you know what's interesting about that too is that we start realizing in that that sometimes the breaks are not punishment, mm. they're gifts. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I learned in like the whole workout cycle thing from this big dog uh, trainer guy here in Atlanta, he requires his athletes to do nothing two days a week. Literally, you're not allowed to run, you're not allowed to lift, you're not allowed to do a push up, you're not allowed to do a sit up, nothing. Two days a week. And they're like, Were you kidding me? That's crazy. I'll be. Di he said, Just trust me. So he spreads those two days out. You know, the people this dude trains stronger, faster, more mobile, more functional long term because they're giving their bodies rest. Yeah. Recovery. Many times in the craft, we view a, a break as, Oh, part of the roller coaster, not doing anything. What if it is God going, you worked your butt off, now it's time to rest. Mm -hmm. We gotta recharge that battery, just like just like we do our phones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But if Ooh. we don't train ourselves to do that, we spin in worry the whole time we're supposed to be rested. Yeah, right. And look, I can, that's a whole, that's a whole hallelujah, amen for me. <laughs> and I mean, it's something that I've intentionally worked through and working through still. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I feel the difference when I take that time. Yeah. Um, Dave Pileggi, brother from another mother. <laughs> I mean, anytime I have anything that I'm doing, I you're always on my list because you are such a gift. You're a gift of, of a friend to me and, and you are a gift to this community of actors. And if you all have not connected with Dave again, all his links will be below in the show notes, link to his book, all the, all the things, all the things. Um, <laughs> So Dave, thank you for sharing space and time with me. Thank you. I love, love you so much. I love you back. This has been awesome. Y'all tap into your magic, tap into your magnetic magic because it's in each and every one of us. It's not gonna look like Dave's, it's not gonna look like mine. It's only gonna look like yours, which is one of a kind. All right, we will see you next time on Booking Magnet Magic. David, thank you so much. You're welcome. I love you. Bye.